to listen to the earlier talk um, that Dr. York uh, gave to us. Uh, if you weren't here for that, I do encourage you to check it out when it is on uh, the Gospel Fellowship YouTube channel. Uh, it was excellent and very helpful. Um, I have the privilege of uh, introducing our, our next presenter, uh, Jim Weidenauer. Uh, Jim is the associate pastor at uh, uh, First Reformed Presbyterian Church in uh, Penn Hills. Uh, uh, he has uh, been the associate pastor probably, what, three months now? Mm -hmm. um, now, before that, uh, Jim had uh, worked uh, for an organization uh, named Harvest USA, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, Jim was the Pittsburgh office of Harvest USA uh, for about 10 years. Um, Harvest, if you're not familiar uh, with them, is uh, based uh, kind of centrally in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, historically, it began uh, ministering uh, to, uh, to people dealing with homosexuality. Uh, it has uh, since then expanded uh, much more broadly, dealing uh, with sexual sin uh, and helping to equip the church, uh, ministering to members and to others um, as it relates uh, to that need. Uh, I have uh, benefited personally from Jim's uh, friendship uh, and his ministry. Uh, really thankful that he's able uh, to be here uh, with us today. Uh, Jim, also, one more thing, uh, Jim had served um, uh, on a, an ad interim committee uh, in the PCA uh, that put together a study report uh, dealing with homo, uh, uh, human sexuality. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, some excellent uh, work that was produced. Uh, I know Jim's contribution was very helpful, uh, leaning on some of his own um, thesis, his THM thesis on I believe it was Calvin's doctrine of concupiscence. So I have that right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, very helpful things that he's able to contribute, and I'm looking forward to his presentation uh, this morning. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, David. Uh, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this morning, for everyone here, for the opportunity to take time off on a weekend and think about the things of God and um, relevant topics uh, we pray that in every uh, session, every speaker uh, would be edifying and encouraging in gospel truth, and I pray that that would also be the case uh, with this one. In Jesus' name, amen. So as, as David described um, what Harvest USA does, I think you will get a sense that um, my concern is very uh, practical. Uh, we we spend a lot of time, I'm, I'm going to be speaking, even though I'm, I'm no longer with Harvest USA and I'm now um, associate pastor full-time at the church, I'm going to be speaking as if I'm still with Harvest USA. I agreed to do this while I was with Harvest USA and this is like kind of a hanging chad or, and we were just in elections, so <laughs> that's a bad thing. Vestigial organ, that's bad too if you're, but um, this is a, not a hangover either. There's no good word for what this is. This is a, this is a commitment that I made that I'm, that I'm fulfilling um, that God prepared me to do. And um, I'm speaking as if I'm still with Harvest USA. So the concern is very practical, meaning we have worked at Harvest USA. I worked since 2012 with Harvest USA, helping many men struggling with all types of difficult struggles, whether that's uh, pornography addiction or uh, a, adultery or same-sex attraction or homosexual practice or all kinds of stuff that I've, that I've sat in my office and in groups. And my concern was always not just cerebral, but I want to help people grow in the gospel and grow in sanctification. And so that's, that's my concern. So when Matthew gave me the topic and he just gave me the topic as just homosexuality, which is about as broad as you can get in that topic, um, I immediately went to what is, what is relevant for what uh, the church is thinking about right now. And so I came to the issue of change uh, especially, and that's been relevant for some time, and I think Harvest USA has had a lot of uh, uniquely Christian things to contribute in terms of the question of change. So my concern is practical, but that doesn't mean that my concern is not theological. And I just want to open... Um, by reading from 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. 
And God will destroy both one and the other. Now, what I'm going to submit to you is that in the context here, the issue is not really eating. Paul is not concerned in this greater passage to talk about how many donuts you have when the box is open. He is talking about sexuality. And he starts off by quoting a general proverb which reflects a way of looking at the issues of sexuality which were very common then and are very common now. And I think you can understand, if you understand the sinful human heart, why that is. It's a perspective on sexuality that says this is all about appetite. This is all about appetite. You, you naturally want something and you go get it. So, hey, the stomach for food for the stomach and the stomach for food. You can imagine people using that as a euphemism for, well, you got to get your needs met sexually. And Paul's answer to that, the beginning of his answer is, after it said, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other, he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So there's two main things that he, that he contrasts there. First of all, he says this is not a biological issue. This is a theological issue because it's about you and you are created by God and belong to God. This is theological. And then the, ne- the next thing he's, he attacks is this um, part of what goes along with the biological view is this Uh, shrinking of experience to the here and now, that this only really affects us here and now in the immediate. And he's saying, no, it's not that God, you know, it doesn't really matter because God's going to destroy the body and food. In other words, what you do with your body sexually doesn't matter because this is all going to go away. He's saying, no, you're united to Christ and you're united to a risen Jesus Christ, which means you belong to the Lord, and as Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be raised from the dead, and therefore what you do with your body sexually makes a difference because you are united to the risen Christ. So he's making this all to say, okay, this is a very practical question, but it is eminently theological. It's eminently theological. So that being said, as as an introduction, uh, what I'd like to do see if this clicker uh, it missed one. Oh wait oh yeah so first I want to present uh, what I'm going to call a false binary and this is a little bit of a play on words um, binary is a is a is a fraught word right now I actually thought um, so Let me get this out of the way. We believe that sexuality designed by God is binary. Meaning, binary means uh, you computer programmers, one or zero, right? But not both. Mutually exclusive, two choices that's at either or, and you can't have one or the other. I mean, you, you can't have both. You have to have one or the other. And we believe that sexuality, gender, is binary designed by God, meaning that by God's design, you're either male or female. So the idea of something being a false binary or non-binary is something that we would not theologically agree with, although we would accept that there's, in a fallen, broken world, there are defects, and that there are people who, who do not present, um, at least as far as we can see, easily, or maybe they're ambiguous in terms of their appearance, and yet we would say by the design of God, male and female are a binary. And yet I'm saying, I'm going to present a false binary, uh, maybe a, a more provocative way for me to have titled this, um, this talk would be um, Homosexuality, a Reformed Non-Binary View. But I chose not to use that title, although I just said it now. And that's because... <laughs> I want to think of a little bit different binary. I want to take that concept and I want to apply it to the way change is often thought of in the non-Christian community and sometimes often historically in the Christian community. There's a little delay on this, so I'm going to make sure I press the button and then wait.
Did it just get bigger? No. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this, and this is not precise, but I'm trying to capture some of the lingo that will that, that is sometimes placed or, or seen in, in the perspective of what I'm going to call this false binary, and I'm just going to call it the gay x gay paradigm. Um, on the gay side, you see, you know, words like affirming, welcoming, gay, LGBTQ+. Um, on the other side is terms like uh, cure, reparative, conversion therapy, change, Exodus International, same-sex attraction. That, this is not a perfect, I mean, Harvest uses a lot of these terms. But the idea I'm trying to say here is that there's a way of looking at change that is an either-or, a, a binary where there's mutually exclusive options and only two that tends to hear whatever term is used and place them into one of these categories. Harvest USA would use the term same-sex attraction, but we would not want to be, as I'll explain, tightly in this binary. But many people who think this way would say, oh, you use the term same-sex attraction. That means you believe someone is cured of homosexuality, you believe in reparative therapy, uh, conversion, whatever you want to call it, um, you believe in orientation change, you believe you can pray away the gay and all that, or, and then those on that side would see these words and say the same thing. Now, what I want to offer instead is that we have to hold a necessary tension. I, I'm, I'm not going to fight too much with the, as long as we can see the right slides. So uh, uh, there's in the Christian tradition, especially as described in the historical, tra historical tradition of um, confessionally reformed churches, and I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you here are from what we would call a confessionally reformed church. Um, the PCA has the Westminster Standards, which is the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and the Westminster Larger Catechism. And if you understand that, um, that that's what we're, we're, the theological tradition that sees those documents as accurately describing what the Bible teaches in these areas, and carefully, uh, with nuance, describing that, then that's uh, what I'm describing. So, this tension is going to involve all these things, corruption, corruption in the Christian, and corruption in the ch and change. So let's look first at corruption. Um, our tradition says, our understanding of the Bible says, that when our first parents fell into sin, they involved us in their sin. And we received from their sin not only the guilt, but the corruption. That our very human nature was made sinful. Our very human nature was made inclined to be hateful towards God, inclined to disbelieve, inclined to hate others. Um, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, inclined to hate God and neighbor, if you're from a tradition that has that as your standard. Um, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, one, in which you once walked following the course of this world. So we're thinking this is the course of this world. This is the way all of humanity is after Adam and Eve. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. It's talking about passions of our flesh, desires of the body and the mind. The Westminster Confession describes it this way in chapter 6. Our, the fall of Adam and Eve is described, and the result is, says that they became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. The assumption is that human nature is, is an integrated whole, body and soul, and that all parts of us, body and soul, have been infected by that sinful inclination. Ephesians 2, the passage speaks about passions of the flesh. Of the flesh. Um, elsewhere in Ephesians 4, it's called futility of mind. Um, 
4.18, Ephesians 4.18 um, calls it foolishness, ignorance, and a matter of the heart. It says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So that's generally, our, we, we believe that that's what we are born into when we're born into this world as fallen human beings. So what is, what is the extent of our experience of that? Now, the extent is from what we call original sin to what we call actual sin, and I'll, and I'll describe that in a minute. The Westminster Confession says this in 6.4, from this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. Now, the difference that it's describing here, when it says, from this original corruption come all actual transgressions, the word actual doesn't mean, like we often will say in our normal speech, the difference between real and unreal. It's not that there's an actual sin is real sin, and original sin is not real sin. When it means actual, it means a sin in act, a sin that is that is that is done, that, is, that, is, that bears fruit in, in a deed. And that can be a deed not only outwardly, but it can be a deed inwardly. It doesn't have to be done with the body. It can be lingering over a thought. It can be enjoying a temptation and not putting it out of your mind or mortifying it, immediate, killing it immediately. There's, there doesn't take, it doesn't take much for a sin to be actual, for you to be sinning in act. But that's distinguished from original sin, which is your tendency or your inclination to sin in those ways. Um, And then Westminster Confession, the next article, says this in 6.5. This corruption of nature itself and all the motions thereof are truly and properly sin. So, What we have here then is we're bridging the gap between original sin, which is your, in the most general sense, your inclination away from God, actual sins, which are deeds that you you commit. Now it talks about this corruption itself is sin and all the motions thereof. And when it's talking about motions, it's talking about something that is, that is historically seems less than an actual sin possibly, but it grows out of that original corruption. And this is what historically uh, theologians would use the category of concupiscence for. Uh, Concupiscence, which is just a Latin word for desire, but it became very technically those kinds of desires that rise up in us without willful or conscious thought. They're, They're manifestations or motions almost involuntary, in some sense involuntary, motions of our sinful nature towards sin. And the confession is saying, and all of the reformers believe this as well, that in the Bible's view, those are also sin. Those are sin. There there may be disagreement if you want to study this in very great detail historically, and whether that's actual sin or original sin, but almost everyone would say it's at least indwelling sin, using the language of um, Romans 7. So when do, you, when do you experience something like this? Let's, let's get this very real. Um, when you have body memory, let's say, of a particular sin. So let's say that your sin is donuts. And you know, now it's not a sin to eat a donut. Definitely not a sin to eat a donut. Thank the Lord. But some of you know in your heart that you, you have a sin of gluttony that you're drawn to. And you know that you don't, you don't see the open box of donuts with, you know, all of, instead of the, instead of the, um, mishmash assortment that your boss usually gets your boss happened to get all of the two kinds that you especially like so there's 50 percent glazed and 50 percent chocolate frosted and spontaneously you feel within you this strong compulsion this feel of i've got to eat four or five of those 
you didn't sit down and say, oh, I see now that there are all of those donuts there, and they're all my favorite, and I know that there's going to be many more than everybody else in this office can eat. And so I think I'm going to set my heart on sinning in my gluttony this morning. It just comes up automatically. Um, it, it, that kind of thing can, uh, we can experience that in regard to desire. We can also experience that in regard to the negative side of our emotions or our desires. So anger, um, you have caller ID, and you have uh, a history of not only maybe possibility of godly conflict with your mother-in-law, but you have a lot of history of ungodly conflict with your mother-in-law, and you have some disproportionate, ungodly, selfish, prideful anger issues with your mother-in-law. And the very sight of her number, not even her number, but her name, coming up on your phone, stirs up in you some of that ungodly anger. Now, let's put aside whether or not there can be godly anger, because there can be, but let's say in this instance, it's not godly. Again, you didn't think about that and carefully decide, I think I'm going to feel that. There's a, a pattern of stimulus and sight and reactions and even, even neurological habits in your brain by which you respond automatically in that direction, which our understanding is, if it's heading in a sinful direction, it's sin. Now, in some sense, it's a temptation, but it's not temptation from outside you. It's temptation from continuing the very sinful desires that you have grown accustomed to experiencing and maybe even fostering in your life. So, this is, this is a hard concept. The idea that we're guilty for these things is very difficult for many people at first, when they first hear it, to comprehend or to, to accept. We want to have a view of sexuality which is, I willfully decide it so that I can confess it. It's, it's hard for us to accept that we sin without willfully deciding it. And yet I would submit to you, we do this all the time. In fact, I would say most, most of our sin is unconscious, not premeditated and automatic. I remember, um, for instance, if you want to get into sins of omission, most sins of omission are this way. Um, the first time that... Um, I realized after I was married and I came home, threw off my coat, sat down in the couch, pull up the newspaper. This was a long time ago. We had newspapers. Pull up the newspaper, put my foot up on the, on the, on the footstool, opened up the newspaper like as if I was like some, from 1950s sitcom or something. And I remember my wife being very hurt and there being an, a confrontation there. Um, my first reaction was, what? I didn't do anything. I, I didn't have any malice towards you. I'm not sure. What, what's the problem? Why, why is my wife mad at me? But then as she explained, and I began to, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, understand, I realized the incredible selfishness that was unconscious in my, in my, and automatic, unconscious in my case, and automatic, that I thought it all revolved around me, and I didn't have to pay attention to what the needs or weariness or concerns of my wife were. When I came home, it, it was my right to pay attention only to myself and my pleasure, regardless of how she suffered throughout the day and how much she needed my help. That was a gross sin of omission. I did not premeditate it but I was guilty for it. Um, I think that most of our sin is that way. Even non-Christians have observed how important the non-willful, non-conscious aspect of our life is. Some of you may be familiar with um, Malcolm Gladwell Blink. Does anyone know the, 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 word, the, the, the book Blink? Um, he does a lot with, this is a, this is a business book, business management book, but he does a lot with what he calls what others have called the adaptive unconscious. Um, he just, the Wikipedia describes it this way. A quick sizing up of the world which interprets information and decides how to act very quickly and outside the conscious view. The adaptive unconscious is active in everyday activities such as learning new material, detecting patterns, and filtering information. It is also characterized by being unconscious, unintentional, uncontrollable, and efficient without requiring cognitive tools. In other words, the fact that you can 
um, kind of a neutral example is that you, you learn to drive and you, don't, you no longer make decisions about your driving. Your body, your body just does it. And sometimes you can, even, um, you can even have whole routes that become automatic where you, you're in conversation and you, you mean to go one place, but you end up driving to work instead because that's where you normally go when you're on this road. I mean, that's the, that kind of a thing. Even those who talk, even those without a godly worldview, who don't even believe in God, recognize that we naturally um, create whole grids of, of interpretation that we no longer even think about. We just act on. What we're saying as Christians is that grid is sinful. That grid from the very beginning is skewed away from God. And so we we develop these ways of automatically acting in ways that are sinful. Um, the Bible also describes the, the activity of the heart as mysterious and hidden. Proverbs 20, verse 5, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Proverbs 29, 20, verse 9, Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. Proverbs 21, 2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. And then you'll know Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So now I want to talk about Corruption and the Christian. Corruption and the Christian. Does this, uh, does this go away when you become a Christian? The Ephesians passages described all of what we were. Does this go away? No. It's still there as a Christian. The corruption is still there. Uh, the confession describes it this way in, in 6.5. This corruption of nature during this life does remain in those that are regenerated. We call this indwelling sin. So Roman, uh, Paul says in Romans 7, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but, the do, the, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do not do what I want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And Paul refers to this in other places of his writing as the conflict of the, the flesh and the spirit, our old way of living and our new way of living, and that those, those coexist in the life of a Christian, that we recognize that we don't immediately, when we become a Christian, we don't immediately become sinless, and all of the inclination of our hearts is gone. We have all of that baggage that we work through. Uh, we don't forget those things. Uh, we're not totally depraved anymore because we have the we have the power of the Spirit. We're not totally depraved, but we are still battling with that corruption. So then, what is the implication of that for change? Um, we believe that there is change in a Christian. So we start with total, total depravity, that corruption, we become Christian, we have the corruption still. Is there any change? Yes, there is change, which is both real and imperfect. So the confession says, when God converts a sinner and translates him into a state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. We do good as Christians and good things that are spiritually good. Yet, Yet, the confession continues, yet so as that by reason of his remaining corruption, he doesn't do it perfectly, nor does he only will that which is good, but he also wills that which is evil. 
So we do good, but that good is always imperfect. It's always mixed in. It's always intermixed with weakness. Um, in Westminster Confession of chapter 13, it says this, They who are once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified, really and personally. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they are more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness. This sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life. There abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence arises a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And there again, the confession is using the language that we see in the Apostle Paul. So we can say, on the one hand, we have these feelings or temptations that come from our sinful nature inside of us, which we experience as spontaneous and not consciously willful, and those are sin. Specifically in Scripture, that's sin dwelling in me or indwelling sin. We also affirm that the corruption of our nature due to sin remains in us who have been united to Christ by faith and given new life. Accordingly, we don't expect indwelling sin to disappear in this life. Nevertheless, we are not to be at peace with any part of indwelling sin that we recognize in ourselves. Rather, we continue to fight it Uh, Not merely by seeking to grow and refusing its demands and desires, but also by seeking to diminish its strength and to demolish its presence in in whatever extent possible, uh, with a promise that there is progress over the long haul. Um, Remember the confession's language, the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness. So, this is, this is the way we talk about all sin issues. And we recognize that all sin issues have an aspect of feeling automatic or involving our bodies or our, our neurons. And yet we talk about this with all sin. And so all Harvest USA does is says this applies to sexual sin as well. No matter what kind of sexual sin you're dealing with, it applies to sexual sin. So then where do we go with that? How does this apply when we, we try to bring this to issue of um, sexuality or homosexuality. Um, The Harvest USA model is to look at our human experience in terms of a tree. And when we're talking tree here, we are trying to go off of Jesus, the way Jesus describes us as either a good tree bearing good fruit or a bad tree bearing bad fruit, or where he says, Um, of the human person, that it's not what comes out of a man that makes him unclean, but what, it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of a man, because what comes out of a man proceeds from the heart, and it's from the heart, from inside, from beneath the visible activity or the deeds where all these things come. And we put these together and say, Jesus is giving us license to imagine ourselves as a tree, and we have the visible parts of the tree, but the problem is not just the visible parts of the tree. It's everything underneath, the, it's inside the tree. It's all the, the aspects of the tree. So what we do with, with our, our model with Harvest USA is we start with fruit. Fruit is the, the arena of actual sin. Things that you do that are sins. And that could be, again, acts, or it could be fantasy or thoughts. It could be things that you're actually doing. That's, that's the fruit. Uh, but we don't want to just attack the fruit. We, we want to acknowledge that the problem, biblically, is much bigger than that. So, um, I knew it skipped one. So we start with the seed, and when the seed we're going to say is the heart, the biblical idea of the heart. And this is saying, um, as the seed is the, the deepest, deepest kernel of what a tree is, your heart, biblically, is this idea of what is the deepest kernel of who you are. Now, we're going to describe other parts of the tree that, in biblical theology, are going to be part of, biblically, the, the actions of the heart. 
But when we're talking about the heart, we're talking about your, your basic inclination of, of what is the direction of your worship? What is the fundamental direction of your heart? Is it soft towards God and the grace of, in Christ? And, and in that direction, have you repented and turned to Christ? Or are you continuing in your um, self-rule, autonomous uh, pursuit of sin? So that's the heart. The soil is all of what's around you outside of your control. It's the, your circumstances, your things that happen to you. Now, we live in a fallen world where a lot of bad things happen. And we believe strongly in Harvest USA that you have to pay attention to that in terms of understanding how your heart has interpreted and reacted to everything that's gone on around you. It is significant if you've been abused in some way or you have trauma in some way. Um, those, those experiences in your soil, as we call them, are very influential, but they're not determinative. They're influential because you're, that's the world you live in, but they're not determinative because your heart is always interacting with it. So one of my colleagues had a, a friend who um, had a diving accident and was paralyzed from the neck down at about the same era that Johnny Erickson Tata had the same thing. Um, Johnny went in the direction she did. My colleague's friend hired Jack Kervorkian, Dr. Death, to help him commit suicide. So the exact same soil experience but they weren't determinative. That wasn't determinative. It was influential, but not determinative in where the, each person went. Oh, man, this is terrible. <laughs> I think I missed roots. The roots represent uh, the desire aspect of the heart, uh, the things that you, that, that you want most deeply. Uh, and I'm thinking here not of uh, something trivial, like you want a new set of golf clubs or something like that, but more like you want to be understood, or you want intimacy, or you want safety and security. You know, maybe in your soil is some trauma, and you, and you desperately want, because of that, your heart deeply wants uh, to know that you are safe and secure. Um, you want to feel important or significant. Uh, these are all desires that uh, it, we could say that God would have met all these desires in the garden for us. Um, Created in the image of God with great significance, with great uh, job to do, given an appropriate level of control over the, over the world, given love and affection, not only in marriage, but also in society in terms of um, the development of, of the gift of friendship and humans. I and mean, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, he wasn't just talking about marriage. He was talking about, do we have a whole world with one man in it or do we have a world filled with image bearers of God? So lots of things that God would have given us, but we now desire by our own rules, in our own way, in our own timing, apart from God's rules, apart from God's provision. That's the roots that represents our desires. Then there's the trunk, and the trunk represents your thinking, your worldview, that, that interpretive grid, the, the ideas that you have, most often that have become unconscious. Ideas like, um, if people criticize me, I'm worthless. Um, unless people uh, say good things or worship me, I have no value. Or beliefs like people are just things that I must use to get what I want. Uh, these are things that we, if, if we would state them, our, our unstated worldview, our functional worldview, they would sometimes shock us. But that's part of the picture, is understanding that. What are, what are we, how are we interpreting the world and thinking about the world? So, the tree... How does this help us? How does this help us apply this? Um, the tree model recognizes the complexity of the human person. And so it resists simplistic diagnoses or solutions. It, it resists the idea that you're just, there's just one key you're going to do and it's going to fix everything. It says, no, if I'm going to work against a particular sin in my life, a tendency that, I, that even... Uh, I recognize, I, I tend to want 
spontaneously. It's going to involve me looking at all of my life, looking at what, hap- what, what is my environment, what's happened when I was a kid, what, what has contributed to that, how has my heart reacted against that, what kind of desires were, uh, were stirred up from those experiences, and how have those desires become idolatrous or godless or not resting in the promises of God? Uh, how, are, how is my thinking messed up? What, what, what kind of ideas do I have that just don't make any sense that according to God's word, um, how can I reshape and transform my thinking according to God's word? And then what can I do also to try to make it more difficult for me to act on these things and produce fruit? So it, it understands that we are whole people that have all of this stuff contributing to our sinful tendencies and our sinful actions. And so the tree model is helpful in that way. It also um, gives us, in particular, um, a way to understand and place the role of suffering in our repentance. I think that the, the appearance of the soil in the model is very helpful. Again, not saying it's determinative, but it's helpful to say, as Mike Emlett has said, that we are all saints and sinners and sufferers. And we can recognize that there's a lot of suffering involved in Uh, what has brought us to where we have to go. And we have to face that suffering in a way that leads us back to God and to his help rather than to our sinful solutions, whatever those are. So I find that that is also very helpful about uh, the tree model. So the picture we get then is not of a binary view where you would say to someone who is struggling with a sin that is of some variety of homosexuality that somehow there's a key that will cure you and like a toggle switch, you will switch your orientation from here to here and, you'll be, and it'll be done. The Christian view rather is that you have, you have a, a habit, a very a deeply entrenched neurological, psychological, emotional, whatever you want to call it, you have a habit of, of feeling attracted to this sin and it's deep and it's multifaceted and the gospel speaks to it. And you can know that you are in Christ, identified with him, given his righteousness and clean before God, trusting in his imputed righteousness and not the imperfection of your efforts. But you can also know that he is going to transform you bit by bit, slowly, over your entire life, constantly giving you change, not only in in regards to this sin, but every other sin that you find natural and easy to do. Um, So that is a completely different perspective, not one that you often hear. You always hear in these conversations people sliding into that binary of either saying, well, you must change, meaning you must change go from having these temptations to having a completely new set of temptations, or they say, no, change is impossible, which is they're saying, basically, we're going to stay on the same binary, but we're going to deny that change is possible. You're always going to be this way. Well, Christian theology says there is a sense in which in this life you will remain fighting with your corruption, but there is a sense that is actually the trajectory going to resurrection in which you will experience change and should be pursuing it. Um, so at this point, I'd love to answer, take any questions we have. What do we do? What do we have this session till 11.15? Is it, David? Yes, 11.15. 11.15. So open to any questions on that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And is it, is it because a lot of the more liberal side of the church don't want to address this issue in this way and want to buy into what is culture pulling first? Or how would you address Yeah, that? how is it? It's certainly divisive, and there's probably, depending on your church context, there may be a different aspect of the issue that is, that is divisive. But I think on the biggest issue... Uh, there's a lot of churches in this country that call themselves Christian churches that don't 
that, that no longer agree that homosexuality is even a sin, that no longer agree that even acting on it is a sin, that they no longer agree that marriage is between one man and one woman. And there's, there's a division there that is deep that parallels, I think, what's going on in our culture um, that I think is unavoidable because, frankly, I just think that's, that's a complete departure from what the Bible very obviously teaches. Um, but then there's, there's various other levels. I think because that division is felt so strongly and people in the church feel it so strongly in terms of it bleeds into political divisions, um, the emotion of schism and division tends to find its way into almost any debate at any level. I mean, you could have the finest, the, the, the tiniest theological debate on this issue, and those emotions will, will come in. And I think it's a reflection of that it's a very big issue. And on that level, I think is a dividing line between the true church and not the true church, basically. Uh, we'll go from um, the front to the back, and I see three hands there. So first, this one here. Yeah, so someone who says that they're a Christian, but they're also, I mean, they're in that camp where they think the Bible allows this and they're living this way. Um, I'm I'm not going to go in detail on that. I think uh, Kevin DeYoung has a great little book called uh, What Does the Bible Teach About Homosexuality? And I think not only is it a model of how to address these issues in a in a compassionate and humble way, but I think he's very orthodox in his answers and he's knowledgeable about what some of the, some of the, um, arguments are. So I would recommend that. Now, we'll go about one-third back. There was another one here. That was going to be one of my questions, and, and it is a big question. It's like, how do we graciously not confront, but respond to the, to the individual? You know, that, that they know that we love them and it's yeah. a concern. Yeah, and some of this gets very personal because I know I've talked to enough people, this is not just someone on the street. This is often someone in your family um, or a close friend or a neighbor or a coworker. So there's a lot of wisdom involved in how to do this lovingly. And I would say what I often say to parents who are dealing with this with a son or a daughter is I say there's a, there's a continuum between maintaining relationship and, and love and concern on one end of the continuum and utter conflict on the other end of the continuum. And I say, the bottom line is, you're not going to be able to avoid either one of those. You're, you, it, you're making a mistake if you go all for maintaining relationship and you avoid conflict at all costs because then you're not testifying to the truth. But you're also making a mistake if you think you're just going to go in like a bull and a child in a china shop and you're just going to blast them, and you don't care what happens, then you're making a mistake of, of, on that side. But where you find that balance, I'm not going to be able to tell you. But you, need the, you need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to understand how you express in a, in a loving and caring way uh, what the truth is while still caring for that person. And um, that's going to have to be wisdom that is given for each situation. Okay, one in the back, all the way in the back, and then we'll come back up to the front if we still have time. <laughs> so mine's similar. I mean, how do you even start a conversation with a close friend? I mean, what, what is the best starting question that would open up discussion about that topic? So if you have a close friend who, say, identifies as gay or something like that, um, if you're going to, I would say, however you particularly start the conversation. I think that fairly quickly in the conversation, it needs to be, it needs to be on big issues. So the issue is not, first of all, sexuality. The issue, first of all, is does God exist? Has he revealed himself? What is the nature of sexuality? And the fact that God has given, we believe, God has told us that he has given us sexuality as part of marriage to show us a picture of the gospel in Christ and the church. And that that's, that's how we understand the nature of what sexuality is. I mean, that's where 
Paul is going when he says the answer is theological, not biological. So how you get there and what, how you do it in a way that makes sense to your friend, I'm not sure how to get there. But I know that generally they're going to want to keep it on the level of you have this view, I have this view, and the first thing you're probably going to hit is I want you to know that your view is hurtful to me, your view is hateful, your view is bigoted. Um, we can't let it stay at that point. We have to know that that's probably going to be thrown at us, and, it, and the expectation is that that ends it, that ends the discussion. But it has to be, really, our discussion of it is much, much bigger than that, and we have to not be flustered by the fact that you'll be accused of being a hater immediately. Because what, our message is much bigger than sexuality, and that's, if they don't accept that bigger message, they have no reason if you don't accept the message of who God is and who, what our state is and what our need is and who Christ is, there's no reason for you to, to step out of a cultural view that allows you to do what you want to do. There's just no reason. Okay, all the way up in the front here. Yeah, I, the thing I'm more concerned well, about... Let's wait for the, the microphone, because I can hear you great, but those in the back probably can't. Yeah, the thing I'm more concerned about is the church and, and individual Christians and the slippery slope. I mean, as we know through history, especially the book that was written 100 years ago by Gresham, mm -hmm. Christianity and Liberalism, there's this slippery slope that it seems that there's this tendency, even Reformed churches, mm -hmm. to go down this slippery slope. I would like to know mm -hmm. what your response is to it. Why and why do we have to be so careful that even uh, this church or any church doesn't go down that slippery slope? Yeah, I think that... Um the idea of slippery slope, there, there's, there is something there, and I think very often um, the way I would understand a slippery slope is it's not, it's not like you just have a slip and slide set up somewhere and you happen to step on it and whew, there, down, down the hill you go. Um, the slippery slope is there because we're in a context in which part of our soil of the tree is a culture that is pushing very hard in one direction. And so when we recognize that, you know, there's multiple forces in our, in our society that are very strongly pushing us to go all the way over here, if we, if, if we don't stay alert to that, then what happens is more and more of our people just start going the way of less... Uh, less conflict, getting along, just, you know, do what everybody expects us to do, and, and we go in that direction. Uh, I think that the answer to slippery slope is not to uh, kind of run in, in the other opposite direction as fast as you can, because there's a slippery slip and slide on the other side of that hill as well towards hypocrisy and um, judgmentalism and I hate to use the word hate, but in the best, truest way, hate. So the best way is to just be, to, to carefully um, look at the scriptures, nuance things carefully, correctly, teach as clearly as we can. And that's why, that's why Harvest USA for a long time has said, we're, we're not in on all of these, these, these two big options on the idea of change because we want to describe the Bible's understanding of change. And gospel change is different than a psychological switch or this or that. You know, it's not any of that stuff. We got a distinct view that only comes from what we hear in the scriptures, and we want to keep trying to, to hit that mark. So again, slippery slope, biblically speaking, I would say that the, the image that we get is do not turn to the right or to the left, but travel on the ridge and that ridge is directed to us by God's word in a very specific way. And that, that's the last one. Oh, can I, all right, can I ask one last question? Uh, you have the right to ask. Um, so uh, uh, certainly there are uh, uh, problems if we are ourselves walking in repentance as it relates to the sin or counseling others. Mm -hmm. There are problems if we see this sin as completely unique compared yes. to other sins. Um, my question is, um, are there conversely um, uh, difficulties if we, if we don't notice some of the unique spiritual dynamics as it relates to this sin? And if that's the case, could you characterize what might be 
some of those unique spiritual dynamics as it relates to this particular sin, as we might also characterize those with regard to other sins? Yeah, I think it's, it's wise with whatever particular sin you're dealing with to look at the dynamics of that particular sin. And we can recognize that some sins, without getting overly specific, some sins are more difficult to break, some sins are more destructive, <coughs> some sins are, um, are just more strike at, the, at our understanding of the gospel. Um, there, there, there are differences, and so I think any sin that involves um, what, we, what, what the secular world would call addiction, what I would call a physiological or neuro, neurophysical momentum, is, it is unwise not to pay attention to that, not to say, like, if you're addicted to pornography, let's take it out of homosexuality, just put it in, well, a lot of men I talk to are addicted to pornography. You have to take into account that there is a momentum in the way the reward center of your brain is working that's going to make this extra difficult. And if you don't acknowledge that, if you think that you're just going to, you know, put an accountability software on your phone and, and, um, and join a group and then you're going to beat this, you're, you're going to miss an important part of the battle. So I think there's wisdom issues in terms of just paying attention to how a sin affects you. Um, people experience this, you know, the sin of gluttony how much money has been spent trying to find diets and whatnot, and it's all because it's, we're not just dealing with what we're deciding, I want to be someone who eats in a healthy way. We're, we're dealing with physiological and neurological momentum that's hard to break. So I think it's wise just to pay attention to those things. Uh, yeah. Jim, thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, we have uh, a brief, probably about not even 10 minute break. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna we, I think it's 11.30, is that what's yeah, up next? on the schedule, so feel free to go and get some coffee, drinks, uh, whatever, briefly, use the bathroom. Uh, back here in 1130, uh, if it's okay, uh, come up and talk to Jim if you have other questions. Um, I'm sure he'd be happy to share more.